So, so far on the Metamorphoses, we've had Apollo chasing Daphne and her transformation into a tree. We have Phaethon riding his father, the sun god's chariot against his will. Again, Jupiter pursues another mortal woman and has to disguise her as a bear. So we're up to Callisto so far in the Metamorphoses and her transformation too. We see Jupiter disguising Io as a cow to hide her from Juno's rage and jealousy. And this sexual jealousy is something that becomes more of a theme as we go on. Finally, at the end of book two, Jupiter disguises himself as a bull to seduce the maiden Europa. And we're going to compare this to Moschus's account to see what it does. Okay, so what we're going to do today instead of this seminar, I'm going to go through each of the passages we've been asked to look at in detail. And then I'm going to draw some of the comparisons and the contrast together. The worksheet of the that I have provided you with on Blackboard is a really simple Venn diagram with some of the key images that I want you to think about today. I think that's the best way of comparing and contrasting the different accounts of Europa and the Bull that we have from Moschus, Horace and Ovid. Okay, so let's start out with Moschus. Hopefully you found from the Oxford Classical Dictionary, if you've had access to it, that Moschus writes with a, an incredible Hellenistic influence. His Europa is actually an Apillion, so a mini epic, and that's the sort of thing that we've talked about before. So it's this idea of a genre of writing that crams an epic scope into a much smaller format um, and writes in a different style of meter. This is Mosca's surviving masterpiece. So it is the literature for which he's best known. And here we have a very different account of the ball than we're gonna find in Ovid. So in Mosca's account, we have a lot of detail and we have an ekphrasis in the middle where the basket that Europa has been carrying has been inladen with different stories. Now that's something we see elsewhere in Ovid's Metamorphoses as well. And don't forget to keep vocabulary um, list for the module to keep a glossary going and it is an extended description of a piece of artwork it's something we see in epic uh, but we also see this quite a bit in things well in places like theocritus so theocritus's first poem is the kasubian poem okay so in this basket um during moscus as europa we have it inlaid with the story of Io, and as I've said already in the introduction today, Io is the maiden who takes the form of a cow, or who Jupiter forces to take the form of a cow in order to conceal her from Juno. So we have a really pertinent story of a similar transformation embedded into Moschus's account. The description of the bull that Jupiter turns into is really very regal though and that's one of the key contrasts that we're going to see when we come up to Ovid. So I'm going to pop some of the text up on the screen for you so we can follow one another in the handout for today. So Moschus's Europa begins with a dream sequence and here Europa is essentially in a tug of war between two women in her dream. One of them seems to be a homeland and one of them seems to be a new place that she a new destination so it's that tension between uh, your birth family and your marital family and one of the things we notice at the end of Moscus is that Europa does actually marry Jupiter however much we trust marry um, she marries him on Crete and this is foreshadowed in her dream because she has this tension between two women pulling her in a tug of war so it's given a little bit more legitimacy, it's part of a prophecy, it's part of a dream sequence for Europa before she is captured. Okay, <clears throat> and we see in the summary that we've been given from lines 28 through 71, the story of Io appears in the Ekphrasis, so that's the bit that we're kind of missing in order to gain coverage across the three different texts for today. But we see that as ever, Jupiter is motivated to transform by the the threat of the wrath of Juno. So if you're filling in your Venn diagrams as we go, that's something that we're going to see in a couple of the accounts. It's worth thinking about putting that in the overlapping section. The wrath of Juno is fairly universal in these versions of the myth. However, what's very, very different is the description of the bull himself in Moschus's account. Moschus presents a bull that's hypersexualized. So the bull in Moschus is presented as Jupiter transformed because it is very supernatural. It's completely golden in colour and it has a silver crest, a crescent um, on its forehead as well as two horns that form the crescent sort of of the moon. So we have a lot of stellar imagery going on. 
um, and his eyes are flashing with desire, so something very supernatural, very metallic. He's distinguished and differentiated from um, your average bull, basically. <laughs> but he's described in terms that we might come across with, say, the stars, the moon, or the gleam of armour. So it's not necessarily particularly dainty or effeminate or funny in any way. Um, he's very appealing and regal and divine. Um, <clears throat> what we notice about Moschus as well is he builds up a kind of multi-sensory description. So we have the divine fragrance. So the smell of this bull surpasses the smell of the meadow. That's something that we're not really expecting at all. Um, you don't need to have spent much time in a farmyard to know that. So he's really unusual in character, um, and there's a severe fantasy element that Moschus is introducing here. We notice that Europa falls under a spell for the bull. So at this point, her desire makes sense. She's struck down by a spell. It's some sort of divine intervention. And so when she begins to touch the bull and wipes the foam from its mouth to kiss it, she's compelled by a spell and it makes much more sense than her developing a serious desire for the bull. She finally allows herself to be abducted. She allows herself to be taken because of the spell that Jupiter has cast on her. So what we start to see is Europa um, fleeing as the bull, sweet, the bull swims through the sea with her on his back. And here we see that Europa is very regal. She has this lovely purple billowing fabric behind her from her robe. Um, and she's sort of captured in that still moment. There's a lovely, lovely portrait of Europa and the bull um, where Europa is very like the Europa of Moscus and we see this billowing purple fabric captured. Um, and we also see the swift turn that the abduction takes. So once she's far away from her homeland, Europa starts to address the bull and concern actually starts to grip her. She seems to come to her senses a little bit more here. She's concerned for her safety, she's concerned about where they're going to live and where are they going to. And the bull in Moscow speaks, the bull is able to reply. So they're headed to Crete and this is consistent with the role of bulls in Greek mythology. If you think about Pasiphae and the Cretan bull, Pasiphae um, sleeps with the Cretan bull in a metal contraption shaped like a heifer and that's how she gives birth to the Minotaur. So they go somewhere where bulls have a specific cultural significance and that's where Jupiter and Europa are, in, are able to end up together. So in this description, she who was previously a virgin at once became the bride of Zeus and at once she became a mother and bore children to the son of Kronos. So we have a really um, heavy-handed fantasy and romance element in Moschus. It might seem bizarre to a modern reader, but it's not necessarily funny. And these sorts of fantasy elements are really popular in, in some of the Hellenistic poetry that keeps getting signposted on the module. So we talked um, a few weeks ago about Polyphemus and Galatea and the theme of the unrequited lover. And Theocritus puts that in a very mythological um, frame in Idyll 11. And I provided the translation on that for you. So you could read it alongside the Akbar Khan article. So it might be worth revisiting that if you want a bit of a flavour of the Hellenistic influences different authors start to apply. So in Moscus then we have this expectation of a divine looking bull, a divine smelling bull, uh, metallic, lots of stellar imagery and cosmic imagery, not necessarily funny in any way. Okay. If we turn to look at Horace we find a Latin poet who's written satires He's written epodes and is now turned into odes, kind of fashioning his work in light of lyric poetry from, say, Archaeus and maybe Sappho too. Okay, now Horace treats these themes in a really different way from, say, previous elegists. Rather than going into having one beloved and really pursuing that as a theme in his odes, they're quite varied. And here we see possibly the darkest account of um, Europa and the Bull so far. So it starts here. In, the mid in our passage, in the middle um, of the abduction scene, where we see Europa start to reevaluate her choices. And we really get a contrast here between the vulnerability of the maiden and the pursuit of the bull. 
So the bull isn't described in such detailed and elaborate ways as he was in Moschus, but here he's presented in a more predatory fashion. So here a lot of the description goes on the snow white body of Europa in contrast to the treacherous bull. We get a clear idea of her vulnerability and she's so shocked about her circumstances, she actually now turns pale. Um, Horace provides us with a really gothic environment. This idea of her turning to the sea that's teeming with monsters um, is something that's not familiar from Moscus, where in Moscus everything has a fairy tale flavour and feels a little bit more um, fantastical. In Moscus we have the dream, we have Europa waking up and going with her handmaidens with beautiful basket to carry the, the flowers. And in Horace, we have her horror as she snaps to her senses. Um, although we have Europa realising she's perhaps made a mistake and showing concern in Moscus, she's not as fearful as she is in Horace's account. So she turns pale at the sea teeming with monsters and at the perils of the middle of the sea. And she starts to shout out, not particularly to the bull, but to her father. So rather than trying to communicate with the beast, she's reflecting on herself and her own poor choices. And whereas in Moscus we have um, an idea from the dream that Europa is meant to be going somewhere else. Remember in Moscus's dream we have two women pulling either side at Europa. In Horace, Europa has no idea what she should be doing and she feels that she's betrayed her father. Um, and she says, you know, from where have I come? Was it better to journey over the long waves or to gather fresh flowers? What am I doing? What choices am I making? Um, and she's threatening to break the horns of the monstrous creature recently much loved because of her regret and because of her terror. So she prostrates herself as worthless Europa, assuming what her father would think if he could see her now. So rather than thinking about a world in which Europa makes her own choices about where to go, about where she has to transition from her family home to creating a new family home as we have in Moscus. Here Europa is under the care of a man at every point. She's worried about what her father would think, that's how she frames her um, ideas of what she's done. She's fearful of the bull and she wants to attack it. So she's always under male control in Horace. Um, and the horror that Europa experiences takes to the point where she contemplates suicide. So you can hang yourself from this ash, tri ash tree, ash tree, by the girdle that has come with you. Um, so ungirdling herself to hang herself with something that is a, a symbol of her virginity. And in Horace, we have an introduction of Venus, laughing Venus, laughing Aphrodite, to this really insidious intervention that we have at the end. Venus came to her with a treacherous laugh and with her, her son, his bow and strong. So we have Cupid and Venus. And we see retrospectively that Europa again has been manipulated. Whereas in Moscus, the ball seems to affect Europa with a spell. In Horace, Venus has intervened and been involved, as has Cupid. And here Venus doesn't necessarily console her in a very comforting way. She tells her what's to come. You don't know that you are the wife of Jove. Stop sobbing. Learn to hear pop properly your great destiny. So we don't really see a reconciliation or a resolution for Europa in the same way, and we don't have it structurally foreshadowed in a dream. Horace presents the most foreboding account of the abduction of Europa so far. If we come back then to Ovid's Metamorphoses, we'll see that the tone is slightly different. In Ovid's account, we can see that Europa is actually not so much foregrounded as she is in Moschus and Horace. Ovid's focus is really on the description of Jupiter as the bull. And the premise of the scene in the setup doesn't start with Europa, it doesn't start with Europa's thoughts and feelings or her dreams in the way that Moschus and Horace have. Instead, what Ovid begins his account with is Jove calling upon Mercury to drive the herd to the, the edge of the water so that he can join them. Um, so he's joining a herd in order to conceal himself, presumably from Juno. Um, and so we see the real contrast because he's joining a normal herd, albeit not as a normal bull. Um, and again, Ovid makes use of this idea of a lack of speech. So whereas in Moscus we had the bull speaking, um, here in Ovid, 
Now Jupiter transforms himself into a bull and lowing joins the herd. So the humour of not being able to speak or articulate yourself as a human. And we've seen that previously where um, Jupiter transforms Io into a cow as well. Um, the way that Ovid describes Jupiter in bull form is actually funny because it's very different from Moschus. So whereas in Moschus we saw that metallic description, that kind of stellar description, there was nothing dainty or effeminate or undermining about it, here Ovid transforms a lot of our expectations of what the bull would be. His side was white, white as untrodden snow. So here we have a sexual aggressor being presented as very pure. We expect the maiden to be white, we expect the maiden to be pale and vulnerable, the way that she is in Horace's version. But here we see that Ovid has moved that theme to Jupiter as the white bull, despite the fact that he's the sexual aggressor. On the one hand, it makes him stand out as a divine bull, as something that, as a bull that's not part of the herd, um, but he's presented in the kind of pure, virginal way that we would expect Europa to be presented at this point. And the way that Jupiter starts to then court Europa in bull form is part of the humour in the parody of Ovid. So he starts ambling through the tender grass. He's sort of sashaying around after her. Um, and then, although he's, he's muscular, he has a hanging dewlap and horns, um, we have this very kind of uh, masculine, proud, strong image that's undercut. So even when Ovid teases up, he cuts his down. The muscles of his neck swell proud below the dewlap hung. His horns, though small, you'd swear a master had handmade so jewel-like they're pure and pearly sheen. So here we have, uh, you know, he's not very well endowed, but good things come in small packages. So we have a bit of humour undercutting what we were expecting from the muscular description that came before. And again, this idea of him being adorned and embellished is very feminine. Um, unlike the bull that we met in Horace, there is no menace or threat in Jupiter's eye in this account. He seems to be caught in the maiden, which is perverse and adds to the humour that Ovid's trying to create here. His mien is very peaceful. Um, and Europa responds really well to this sort of courtship because she's very, very naive. Um, and the fact that Ovid's able to present a bull who's snow white with sort of glittery horns, and on the one hand is, is funny and it parodies what we've seen before, but on the other is perverse. There's no real spell here. There's no divine intervention in the same way that seems to manipulate Europa. She seems to genuinely be attracted to the bull, not necessarily in a sexual way, but she treats it like a pet. You know, it's just a sweet animal to her and that makes her abduction perhaps even darker once we've gotten over the hilarity of Jupiter prancing around in this unassuming, very pure looking uh, guise. So here, um, gentle as he seemed, she feared at first to touch him, but came up to him and offered fresh flowers to his soft white lips. And this seems to be a really clear subversion of Moschus' account, where we see the maiden brushing the foam away from the bull's lips to kiss him, so it's hypersexualized, and it's clear that Europa has been um, affected or afflicted with a spell, with some sort of um, external motivation other than being courted by a bull. Here, a very young, naive Europa feeds the bull. She treats him like a pet. Um, and he kind of courts her. So Ovid gives us a bit of an insight into the bull's state of mind. So he kissed her hand and then hardly, oh hardly could postpone the rest. So here, you know, it's expectation and reality. And that adds to the humour. It also adds to the kind of dark undertones. Not all as quiet as it seems. In a way, it's more insidious than what we've seen in Horace because we know that the bull has sexual intentions and yet Europa is just playing with a pretty bull. So it could, in a way, be seen to make this quite a bit darker. Okay. And we see this come through in the way that Europa interacts with the bull. She feeds it flowers and then she makes a garland for its head, at once showing the, um, the kind of perverse nature of the courtship but at the same time presenting Jupiter to be kind of effeminized and toyed with and played with as a pet. So he really allows himself to be subjugated by this girl in order to trap her. 
which is particularly insidious. And we see right till the very end, he saunters. We never really get an insight into Europa's mindset. Ovid really puts us in Jupiter's perspective in this account. And Europa, you know, Ovid tells us about her reaction, but he doesn't vocalise her thoughts, he gives her no dialogue, we don't see into her thought process in her mind. She's a very one-dimensional, naive, flat character. She's a daft girl, really. We don't get her reaction in the same way that we do, say, Moscus and Ovid. So, Ovid tells us that fear filled her heart as gazing back she saw the feet, the fast receding sands. Her right hand grasped the horn, the other leant upon his back and her fluttering tunic floated in the breeze. So what we're left with is a perfect description of the oil painting on the screen right now. It's something very static and very unreal, and that is the finale of Jupiter Europa. We don't see the same resolution. We don't see the same divine intervention. What we see instead is a very perverted kind of courtship, and a courtship that fits into a bigger cycle of rapes in the metamorphoses. So, um, I mentioned already Apollo and Daphne. Um, I mentioned um, Io and Callisto. And we see that this is the sort of thing that Jupiter does routinely. And every single time we see this theme, Ovid tries to present it in a slightly different way or inject it with pathos in a different way. Io, as I mentioned, loses her ability to speak and that becomes part of the pathos of her story, but she ingeniously manages to write in the sand. So Ovid really manipulates the metamorphosis theme to make that the centrepiece of the story. And that's one way that we might reevaluate Ovid's account in comparison or in contrast to Moscow's and Horace's. In Horace's it fits in with a broader poetic project of the odes of the different songs um, and it's influenced by say Alcaeus and Sappho in a very varied collection with no cohesive unifying theme. When we look at Moscus we have an Apillion where we've got this sort of um, sustained narrative over a shorter um, scope than an epic for example but something where we're going to see more resolution, we're going to see a little bit more character development, a bit more space for that. And in the Europa, the you know the overarching protagonist is Europa. The focus is on her. We get her dream sequence. We have um, a good understanding of her thoughts and feelings and her characteristics. In Ovid, the centerpiece is the metamorphosis itself, and that's part of Ovid's broader political, political, broader poetic project. Um, to show transformation in its varied, varied and different forms. Ovid set out to do something completely different with this epic, not present us with a cohesive narrative with one protagonist. Transformation and mutability are his areas of focus, and that's why here the image of Europa being abducted serves as a little vignette that Ovid will use to then segue on to something else. Okay. So I hope that was helpful for you and I encourage you to revisit this material with the secondary reading, which hopefully you'll have time and space to do now that you're at home and you're settled securely, hopefully. Okay, I am going to make myself available on Skype this Friday for University of Leeds students on the module, the light literature module, if you want to convene about the secondary reading and develop your thoughts from there. Um, do get in touch with me if you want to meet and have a video chat about that and until then stay safe um, and keep in touch. Thanks. Sorry for being late today. Another one of my projects is creating illustrations of the ancient world to sell online. I'll leave a link in the description below. So far we've got vintage travel posters of the Colossus at Rhodes, the Hanging Gardens of Babylon and the Lighthouse at Alexandria. I'm aiming to complete the other four of these seven ancient wonders this month. So have a look on Redbubble and please like and share and pass it on. Thanks.